Warning! This is a video about Hearts of Iron 4 made by someone who doesn't know how to play Hearts of Iron 4. If you do know how to play Hearts of Iron 4, you're not going to like it. You've been warned. Hello there and welcome to the Ophidia abridged commentary of a Hearts of Iron 4 campaign. This is going to be based on my very first Hearts of Iron 4 campaign and for that reason, as things began, I was looking around thinking, is there some kind of easy country I can play as that's like somewhere close to the action but probably isn't going to get destroyed or something like that. That's why initially I was looking at Ireland there thinking we've got lots of stuff between us and a Nazi invasion or something like that, so maybe we'll be okay. But then I thought, well, if we actually hide in the corner, I guess nothing's gonna happen. Like, you could just go hide in the corner of the map and not participate in World War II. So that's why I switched over to this other choice, Belgium. Also partially because I played as Belgium before, when I played the Great War mod for Napoleon Total War. So it's a reference to something. Now Belgium's a bit of a dangerous choice, because we're going to be right on the front line. Very vulnerable to Nazi invasions but I liked the idea of having a small patch of territory that I can just zoom in on and then sit there trying to work out how the UI works in the background and generally learn the game. And we'll have a challenge for ourselves, won't we? The Try Not To Die As Belgium Challenge. And I will have a few advantages over real life Belgium in that I'm from the future as it happens and we've picked the historical mode thing. So if things are going to go vaguely as they did in history, we can use that to anticipate what exactly we're going to be facing and maybe be a bit more prepared for it. Well, we'll see. So to start with, this series will be essentially me talking through what preparations I decided to make for World War II, and then at some point, once it actually happens, we'll put those preparations to the test. The first thing I noticed is there's a gigantic river in Belgium, so that's a key defensive feature we might want to use. I was eager though to see what the other countries nearby thought of me. Obviously it would be very good to make sure we have some kind of alliance with France, the Netherlands and Britain, the countries around us. Worryingly, I couldn't even get a non-aggression pact with some of my neighbours and I started to wonder, well, if France actually won't commit to not invading me, what is their motivation and how historical is the historical game mode actually going to be? I think this is a bit misleading because while I apparently can't become friends with the Allied Powers, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm not in the Allied Powers. I think there's some kind of background system of which country is considered to be an ally or in the Axis. And it's not indicated at first, but it just sort of works through that way with the historical nudging the game is getting. So while the English don't really like us much more than the Nazis or anything like that, we are going to be on the not Nazi side of the war, which is always a nice place to be. So diplomacy aside, we begin the game and what I'm going to be doing and what I'll mainly be cutting out is micromanaging production of stuff. This surprised me in the tutorial. I'd actually never seen Hearts of Iron before playing it and I had no idea it would be like this. I figured it would be much more about fighting. It's actually mainly, as far as I can tell, about trying to manufacture guns and that's particularly true for Belgium because we actually start with not even enough guns to arm the army we started the game with and we need a whole bunch of stuff. We need trucks, we need radios and general gear. Well, we need everything. So what I'll be doing is micromanaging factories to gradually make stuff that our army will eventually be able to use, hopefully anyway, and of course I need to build more factories and things like that. In terms of technology, we don't start in the best position, we don't even have some World War I technologies at the moment, we need to invent mortars and machine guns, that'll come in useful. We could also do with working out that tanks exist, we still don't know about Great War tanks. It was a bit further behind than I imagined we'd be. But I started thinking, well, I'm just not going to bother with tanks really. You can see I'm looking down the anti-tank cannon tech tree. I started thinking, if we're going to get blitzkrieged by the Nazis at some point, the main thing we need to do is stop the enemy's tank advances. So we need to invent regular artillery, and then from there we can invent anti-tank guns. I feel like these things must have existed in World War I, but we need to work them out eventually. We don't have any, suffice to say, so it would be nice to manufacture some modern ones at least. The other thing we need to do is pick a focus, kind of like another tech tree. 
and this kind of determines what you're going to do with your army, but because my army pretty much just needs to work out what guns are at this stage, we're not going to do anything special. I'm going to focus on industry. I want to take advantage of all the focuses that give you extra factories and things and speed up your industrial research because we need to invent tools as we can see there and we just need to make all of the facilities that will one day make the planes and anti-tank guns that I hope to invent before the Nazis show up. So that's the plan there. There's also doctrines we have to select from. This is vaguely determining how our army is going to operate. We start off in the Grand Battle Plan Doctrine Tree. We've invented trench warfare, so we clearly were paying some attention to World War I. I want to get down to prepared defense, because prepared defenses sound exactly like what we're going to have to do in order to stop a Blitzkrieg. Unfortunately, these doctrines aren't mix and match. I wanted to also have superior firepower and spam anti-tank guns and artillery. But if you do that, then you can't have prepared defense because they're in different trees. So we're going to keep with the one that we started in. And now we organize together an army to defend Belgium. We've got one officer, so that guy's going to have to lead it. And we start off with a whole bunch of divisions already in the field. A couple of those divisions, though, are cavalry divisions. Not sure how useful they'll be. I think I eventually took them out of the army and just left them at the back somewhere. Everyone else? Well, it's infantry divisions, some of which have guns. So we've got a long way to go before we can beat the Blitzkrieg. It was at this stage, though, I noticed, hello, we also have this. I completely forgot about the whole Africa situation. It's the past, and Africa doesn't exist. It's just a whole bunch of extensions of European countries. So we have a much bigger territory in Africa than we do have in Europe, actually. We control the Congo and such. And I figured, well, this is great. We can secretly manufacture a whole bunch of tanks down there or something and ship them up just in time. We also have a tiny army sitting here. I think I have to sit it there because it's like a garrison army that's keeping the locals in check or something. So we're just going to ignore them for now. Back at home, here's what a lot of the gameplay actually was for me. It's looking at the logistics screen and noticing we have deficits in everything and then just micromanaging to try and manufacture stuff. Over time, the deficits will go away, and it looks like right now it's going to take us an extremely long time to actually arm our armed forces, but we're going to sort that out over time as we build more factories and speed up production of things. I started poking around with our African colonies, trying to see if I could get any use out of them. I eventually determined that I probably couldn't. Do let me know if that's not the case, because I've just kind of ignored them from now on. I don't know what exactly determines whether you can build somewhere, but in this case, we're not allowed to build things in this territory. I'm guessing because it's all just rainforests and there's no open ground or something, there's no infrastructure. It was classified as wasteland or something, I seem to remember, in the game. So it doesn't do anything. It does apparently add to our manpower. We can recruit people from these territories at some point. At least, by the looks of things, it's all 0% resistance to our occupation of this territory, so the locals don't seem to mind us being here. Or perhaps they haven't even interacted with us, because I doubt we even sent anyone into those jungles before deciding it's our territory or what have you. So yes, we do have a vast amount of foreign territory, but I don't think it's going to be coming to our aid all that much. This video is sponsored by me, creator of the top-rated turn-based tactics game Godless Tactics. With a 98% positive review score, it's probably better than whatever you're watching me play right now. Search Godless Tactics on Steam and support the officially Devin channel by purchasing the game. I'm 98% sure it's worth it. A while later, I was poking around in the political screen where we can enact various things to help us out. And I notice right now we have only a volunteer army. We could do conscription to get more troops. Obviously, Germany is going to have a lot more troops than us, so that would be handy. But I didn't do that because right now we're struggling to make enough guns. So I was like, well, having loads of troops may not actually help at this stage. How very un-Soviet of me to say that. I decided instead to go with an industrial guy on our cabinet to improve the speed at which we're industrializing and preparing to manufacture more things. Now jumping ahead again, it got to the point when it's time to start building us some defenses. We can fortify little bits of territory, and I figured, well, here's an ideal place to fortify, the other side of this big river. 
In the paradox game logic, the enemy will always have to be crossing the river to get into the territory from that direction, so if we fortify the other side as well, our small army will get an unknown amount of buff and maybe do better. It does mean we're leaving the enemy with an airfield right in front of our front line so we're asking to be bombed. I can also fortify our actual border with Germany. The problem is they can just go around those forts through Luxembourg or the Netherlands. You might be thinking, hey Devon, aren't you actually just doing the Maginot Line plan, the thing that famously did not work? And the answer to that question is yes, but we're just going to move swiftly on from that. Later on we come to the division designer. I've now invented artillery and I needed to find a way to put it into our armies. We've got all these divisions of troops and we can see here that each division is just nine blocks of infantry, but we can add on some artillery as well. That probably is going to be a good idea. The thing is, adding stuff to divisions requires army experience. I guess this means your guys do have artillery in theory, but they don't know how to use it, so we can't really add it into the command structure. So we need to gain army experience. We currently have zero army experience points, meaning we can't do anything right now. Although I got five points by doing a certain focus, this allowed me to add anti-tank guns after they were invented. Decided to prioritize that. You can see me here overzealously attempting to add three units. Because I kind of thought, well, they're all the same unit. Maybe you only have to pay for it once to add it multiple times. But no, that is not the case. An intern comes in and starts telling me about the Olympics and how well Germany did. Not what we want to hear right now. My guys don't know how anti-tank guns work. And Germany probably has quite a few tanks that are going to be coming our way. So I needed to find a way to gain army experience. At some point or another, I did find you can set your troops to be doing field exercises. And this does gradually gain experience for you, although it also costs equipment or something because they're breaking all their stuff in the process. So we'll start building up some experience points. In the meantime, doing some trading here with other countries because we need some more raw materials to start manufacturing loads of anti-tank guns. So yes, before I can even use my army experience to put anti-tank guns into the divisions, we need to make loads of anti-tank guns, so I guess we might as well get on that first. This means we need to deprioritize other things and have an opportunity cost because by making these anti-tank guns we're not making, say, artillery or planes. So we're just going all in on the anti-tank guns for now. I discovered that we can hire a military theorist to our government, and if we do that we'll constantly gain army experience in the background, so that's just what we need. By the time all of our equipment's ready, we should have enough experience to actually give the equipment to the armies, and then we'll be in business. And on top of the army exercises as well, we're actually going to be gaining experience quite quickly, and we'll end up with more than we'll need. And there's some more good news. We've invented tools. This is going to increase the speed at which we'll be making those anti-tank guns and stuff. You have an interesting decision you can make here where you switch between concentrated or dispersed industry. Dispersed is a little bit worse, but it's less vulnerable to being attacked, and I figured that's probably what we want to go for. I eventually picked it in the end, because there's a good chance we're going to be bombed quite a lot, so having our industry hidden in various places might help us carry on even after the war starts. Here we are in the future, when I've got some more experience, and we're going to put more anti-tank guns in the army. The question now was, how many is too many? Like, should it be all anti-tank guns? What actually is going to be a good balance setup? I had no idea, but I decided to stick with always having the nine blocks of infantry and then just adding extra equipment on top of what we already had there. So yes, now that I've added two anti-tank companies or regiments to each division, I have to manufacture even more anti-tank guns to meet that demand. So we just sit back and wait for that to happen. In the meantime, I was spying on the Germans here. Looks like they have set up armies on their border with us. But they don't look very strong, so I wasn't feeling too worried right now. We've also finished getting the armament focus things from the focus tree. This means we have a bunch of free factories online now, meaning our weapons will be produced faster than ever before. Just as well, because we need more and more weapons. I also invented the anti-air gun, so I figured that's going to be pretty useful for us. 
since one part of being Blitzkrieg is that you get bombed and attacked by a lot of planes, so having all the anti-tank guns is all well and good. We need some anti-air guns to keep them alive, so I am going to integrate those into the divisions at some point as well. Again, have to do a bit of trading to work this out. And it's quite interesting with the trading, in order to get materials from other countries, you don't have to pay anything. You have to give up your ability to build things, which is a weird trade-off. So by manufacturing these weapons at maximum speed with all the resources we need, it's slowing down my efforts to fortify that river line. This is going on right now, as you can see. It's going to take a long time to fortify it, but you can fortify the same place over and over again to make it extremely heavily fortified, which we'll do if we have time, of course. Here you can see we've got a more balanced and complete division setup now with two anti-tank, one anti-air, one artillery, and eight infantry. I think I also added support anti-tank as well. Not quite sure what that is and how it differs from regular anti-tank, but it's going to be in there at some point. So now again we sit back and manufacture all the stuff we need to actually fill out those divisions with the weapons I've told them to use. And in the meantime, just kind of wait, we've built most of the factories and infrastructure that we can use. We're just going to spend all of our construction time building up our defensive positions. You can see I was considering heavily fortifying our tiny border with Germany. But I ended up cancelling all of those builds thinking realistically they can go around it both to the left and right so there's no point fortifying that spot we'll stick to our river line started looking around the map because stuff is going on the war is beginning to brew up we've got japan invading china on the other side of the world we also have the spanish civil war going on there's that thing in the top right the world tension meter and the higher that gets the more warry things are, I suppose. I don't know what it's going to mean for us, what the world tension is, but what I hope is it increases your support for war. We have low support for war among our people, but when things look really edgy, I suppose they'll just say, well, fine, and then they won't mind if I can script them all, that sort of thing, which would be good because we're starting to run out of people to actually man all of these new units I keep putting into the armies. We've invented radio that's going to come in handy no doubt i wanted to specialize in this bit of the tree the electronic engineering tree because you can grab things like radar stations and i figured one way to help combat the fact we're going to be out industried by the enemy air forces is to do the battle of britain strategy to have early warning systems and basically buff up all of our fighter planes in the game's logic so I'm going to focus on working towards inventing and then building a radar station somewhere in Belgium. I do have an air force, by the way. It's only 20 planes and they suck, but we'll get to that. I've also nearly finished the prepared defense doctrine. So once that's ready, our troops will be better at sitting still, which is what I want them to do. And here I am looking at the aerial tech tree and thinking, let's just straight up get a good fighter. We have a very interwar looking fighter. Let's get some kind of fixed wing, modern-ish looking fighter and build that so at some point we'll have an air force. And the other reason I was thinking about getting an air force is because our manpower is getting a bit low. Planes don't take that many people to operate. You have a ground crew as well, so there's plenty of manpower involved, but less so than making infantry divisions. So I figured going for air superiority might suit our small country size. I managed to spam my way down the focus tree to get extra research slot. That's the sort of thing you really want to get as soon as possible to maximize the benefit. That's going to help us out in the background. And next, I'm going to be going for secret weapons. This gives us some bonuses to our research on radar systems, among other things. We could try and go for nukes right now, maybe nuke our way out of this problem. But I decided to go for radars. And if it is a secret weapon, then the enemy might not know we have it, and that will give us some unseen advantage. Time carries on, moving on, how dare it, and you can see we're now in 1938, so pretty close to World War II. Germany has anschlussed Austria out of existence, and we now see troops building up all across the borders. The Germans are still sitting there on our border, not really doing very much, and I was still feeling pretty good because our army's moderately large compared to what they have right there. And we're also now packed out with quite a few weapons. 
Every time we fulfill our weapons needs, I've just been adding something else to the divisions. I don't know if this is a good idea, but you can see I've sneakily thrown in some more artillery and some more infantry on the bottom there. And here I actually go and throw in another anti-tank regiment as well. So every time our stockpiles fill up and we have what we need, I just keep adding more needs because I figured we don't want our factories to not really be helping if we still have time to make more anti-tank guns and spamming our front lines with more of them then fine just keep making stuff so yes we're still manufacturing weapons en masse and constantly using them for stuff I'm also now researching the air superiority doctrine as part of my preparation to try and do something against the Luftwaffe we're also going to need some of these. Time to manufacture some fighters for us. We only have our little 20 man air force at the moment. So we're going to have to focus our industry on making all the planes we'll need to actually do anything with, with all of our aerial preparations. I've also grabbed the equipment effort focus there, which lets us research infantry weapons a bit faster. That's going to come in handy in a second. In the meantime, I need to make use of my secret weapons focus to research things over here. We've unlocked the first level of radar station. We can now start working on a better version and we can work on computing machines as I'm doing here. And I'll go on to pick both decrypting and encrypting technologies. That's again an attempt to improve our early warning systems and make the best use of our defenses. I don't know how well that's going to work or if it will do anything but that's part of the experiment of this particular campaign. And here you can see me setting up some radar stations, or putting them in the build queue, I should say. Annoyingly, you can't choose where they are. They have to be in set places, and one place is on the other side of our defenses. I started making one there anyway. Not necessarily a good idea, because it's in the zone the enemy will occupy, so then they'll have a radar station. Well, we'll see, I guess. Would have been nice to put it right behind the front line. So now, once again, we wait as has most of this campaign been so far but this time we're going to be waiting while making planes instead of artillery guns we can also use that equipment focus i mentioned to grab this we can get a submachine gun among our infantry i'm sure the germans have this already so in order to match them we'll have a similar sort of weapon available and very quickly thanks to that focus is actually getting a debuff to research time because it's from the future. That was a 1939 design and it's 1938, so the equipment focus will allow us to get that in a futuristic fashion and hopefully have enough time to manufacture it before things kick off. More annoying micro with the economy there because I needed one rubber, but the minimum amount I could buy on the market was eight, so we're wasting a whole bunch of our construction resources there. With our new industry to make planes, in action, I decided to increase the size of the Air Force to 100 planes. That's the target, up from 20 before. We also have to wait for crewmen to be trained, etc., I presume anyway, so we can't very rapidly make an Air Force. But as time went by, it became clear we're easily going to manufacture 100 planes before things kick off. So I increased the target to 400 planes instead, thinking we're probably going to get about that amount before like the end of 1939 comes around and things get dangerous but we'll see I did have reason to rethink that actually in a minute. Here I'm finally getting together our government and starting to get serious about war. We can partially mobilize the population and the economy, not quite sure what that means but it means I can have more fuel stockpiled for starters, that's useful, and it is a matter of fuel that started to influence my decision making. I'd been ignoring fuel so far, but it turns out the Air Force actually wants to use fuel. And this discovery comes in tandem with the discovery that we can send our pilots on aerial exercises to gain experience, which we, which we certainly need them to do because they're all pretty sucky at the moment. And yes, you can see here that while our planes are in the air doing exercises, we can't sustain this, we're actually losing our fuel stockpile. So with that in mind, I figured, well, there's no point trying to make a 400 plane air force because I won't be able to use it, we'll just run out of fuel. So it, because of that, we're going to scale it down and aim for a 200 plane air force, which actually we already have. So now we have the planes that we can use plus a backlog of planes to bring in as they crash and stuff. That sounds like a good idea. And yes, by the way, there are ways to just get more fuel in order to get around this, but maybe it wasn't in the tutorial. I had no idea. I am going to discover that at some point, as we'll see. 
and there's me getting encryption. With any luck, we can keep the Germans from finding out that we don't have any fuel. Now then we get into some more waiting, even more weighty waiting than before, because I'm kind of ready. I've got a lot of stuff that we could potentially use to hold off the Blitzkrieg that I presume is coming. You can see I'm also gradually researching some tanks. I decided to have one slot play catch up and actually get us back into the tank game. At some point we may be able to cheekily manufacture some if we retain our manufacturing capacity as the war begins. We don't really know what's going to happen there. At some point during this waiting period, I also grabbed the limited conscription policy. So now we're not running out of people, I've got guys to man the new regiments I'm putting out. I'm kind of keeping them in reserve for now and not really recruiting too much more. Although the game does bug you if you're ever not trying to make a new division when you can, so I keep training basic divisions, which is probably going to drain that manpower, we'll see. There's me reaching the experience level of regular with our air force. This is when they stop getting any better for training, so you might as well stop training them, which also will allow us to save fuel, and I'll very slowly start, start stockpiling it as a result. And yes, now we're just going to wait and see what happens here. As we creep through the year 1939, which is a significant year in a World War II game, as you might imagine, we've got what we need in theory, but we can make it better. We can upgrade our anti-air guns and our anti-tank guns in preparation for potential tank rushes we're going to focus on the anti-tank option the thing is once you've made a better version of the anti-tank gun you have to remanufacture it so after spending all these years putting together our current arsenal it's going to be hard to make another one in time but we'll have that going in the background anyway we're also preparing anti-air defenses in our cities and I can upgrade my radar station there to help out with those same anti-air defenses presumably and with our new air force which may be able to stop us just getting blown up and of course we can still spend more time fortifying the front line even more before the enemy show up. So then this is where I will end this part and now it's up to you to go into the comments and make your prediction. How long will Belgium survive when Germany invades, probably in the near future? Make your bets, and I suppose make your bet as to whether part two will be the final part of this series, which right now is a very real possibility. I really have no idea what Germany is actually going to send at us, so I've been using my historical predictions here to try and get ahead of the game. We'll see how that goes. Join me for part two where I will either celebrate my genius foresight or I will blame everything going wrong on someone else.